Hey everybody, and welcome to this video on 21 High Yield Facts for USMLE Step 1, GI Anatomy and Histology. 1. The celiac trunk originates from the abdominal aorta at the level of T12. So we'll go through the uh, blood supply here, but first let's just take a look at the celiac trunk specifically. So we'll look at the branches of the celiac trunk. So the first branch, so you can see the celiac trunk is you know coming off of the uh, aorta, and then we're going to say that the celiac trunk starts right about here where this circle is. So we have a few branches. The three major branches <clears throat> here are the common hepatic artery, which is going to be going over towards your left here. So this that's the only one on here that's not labeled, which is this one here on the left. So going from the celiac trunk to the left, we have the common hepatic artery, and then you can see there's some hepatic branches there that we'll talk about in a minute. So we have the common hepatic artery going to the left. Up here, we have the left gastric artery. And just to give you some context, so here's the esophagus, right, going into the stomach. And we would say that this curve here, the smaller curve of the stomach, this is the lesser curve, and this big curve here is the greater curve. So the left gastric artery is kind of over here supplying more of this lesser curve area here. Okay, so that's the second branch of the celiac trunk. The third branch of the celiac trunk runs behind the stomach. So you can see it kind of transparent there. That's the splenic artery or splenic artery. Okay, so you have three major branches, the common hepatic, and now the common hepatic, going back to that, that comes over here and eventually forms two uh, separate pathways. So the common hepatic will go on to form the hepatic artery proper, okay, and the other branch that it divides into is this gastroduodenal artery, okay, which we'll talk about both of these here in a minute. Um, so you might be asking, how much detail do I really need to know? You should definitely know the three branches um, for step one. Now, in terms of important branches, you should know that the left gastric artery comes off of the celiac trunk. The right gastric artery, okay, which you can see is kind of supplying the right lesser curvature of this person's stomach, that comes off the hepatic artery proper. Okay, so it's good to distinguish those two, kind of where they're coming from. And then eventually, the hepatic artery proper will just go on to um, form your cystic artery, right? So your gallbladder, and then your right and left hepatic arteries, okay? Which makes sense, right? Because they come from the hepatic artery. So the big things to remember here with the hepatic arteries, uh, or the common hepatic artery, is that it eventually branches, and it uh, forms the hepatic artery proper and the gastroduodenal artery. And then your right gastric artery will come off of the hepatic artery proper to supply the right lesser curvature. And the, l the left lesser curvature of the stomach is coming from the left gastric artery, which is the second branch from the celiac trunk. Okay, now let's just talk about this gastroduodenal artery briefly. So the gastroduodenal artery um, will go on to form two arteries. Now we talked about what supplies the lesser curvature of the stomach. The greater curvature of the stomach is supplied by these gastroepiploic arteries, okay, or sometimes written as gastroomental arteries. And so they run around the greater curvature of the stomach and anastomose. Now on the right side of, the, of this person's stomach, so on the left side of your screen or on the right part of this person's greater curve here is the right gastroepiploic artery, okay? That's coming off this gastroduodenal branch. The gastroduodenal branch also uh, gives off a superduodenal artery, but the big one here is this right gastroepiploic artery, which anastomoses with a left gastroepiploic artery, and the left gastroepiploic comes from our splenic artery. And remember, the splenic artery comes from the celiac trunk. So let's recap all of this one more time just to um, see if we can we can get it all here. So the celiac trunk gives off three branches. The three branches are the common hepatic, the left gastric artery, and the splenic artery. The left gastric artery supplies the um, lesser curvature here more on the left side. And the lesser curvature here on the right is supplied by the right gastric artery, which is a branch of the um, hepatic artery proper, which comes from our common hepatic artery. As far as the greater curvature of the stomach goes, th that's supplied by the uh, gastroepiploic arteries. The right gastroepiploic artery comes from the gastroduodenal artery, which is also a branch of the common hepatic. The left gastroepiploic artery comes from the splenic artery, which is a branch of our celiac trunk. Now, the only other thing I haven't really talked about here is this: these short gastric arteries. These short gastric arteries supply the fundus of the stomach, so up here. Okay, and these also come from the splenic artery. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. If you can kind of look at this and wrap your head around this, I think that it will definitely help separate you um, from, you know, just an a that average level of understanding of GI anatomy and kind of take your, your scores to the next level. Two, the superior mesenteric artery can cause compression. And so there's really two major types of compressions that we'll talk about. And I broke this into two slides because I didn't want to make it too messy. Before we talk about the, the compression, though, let's just review the anatomy of the superior mesenteric artery. So we already said that the celiac trunk branches off at T12. So a level underneath that at L1, we have the superior mesenteric artery branching off. So we can see here, here is our, you know, um, it looks like the aorta, and we have a, a superior mesenteric artery kind of branching off down here. Then it's kind of hard to see. Let's make this bigger. 
Okay. And so once the superior mesenteric artery branches off, it's going to give off a few different branches. It's going to give off a right um, colic branch and a, a middle branch. And the right branch specifically forms this iliocolic um, artery here. And these are all forming these arcades, as you can see across here. And also, remember, um, there's an inferior pancreatic code duodenal artery that supports the, that supplies the distal portion of the duodenum and the head of the pancreas. Remember, the superior uh, or more proximal portion of the duodenum was supplied by the um, superior pancreatic code duodenal artery that we talked about previously. So that's the superior mesenteric artery. So it kind of starts here and it supplies this ascending colon and about two thirds of this transverse colon here is all going to be supplied by the superior mesenteric artery and it branches off at L1. Now, we said it can cause compression, so what do we mean by that? So there's two major syndromes you should know. The first one is superior mesenteric artery syndrome, named uh, conveniently after the artery. So this is when the artery compresses the transverse portion of the duodenum. So let's just take a look at this picture here. So uh, we have our stomach forming our duodenum over here. Now here's the superior mesenteric artery branching off at L1, and it's running just over the duodenum, you can see here, and between the duodenum, it, uh, excuse me, between the uh, superior mesenteric artery and the aorta behind it is the duodenum. It's running right in the middle, and you have these two vascular structures, arterial structures, and with enough pressure, they can push on the duodenum, cause duodenal compression. And so what happens? Well, then your food can't move through the duodenum. And so uh, you get uh, nausea, vomiting, bilious vomiting, right, because um, of the location. You get uh, weight loss, postprandial epigastric pains. Um, so it looks a lot like a small bowel obstruction. Um, and this portion of the duodenum, I, I mentioned here, transverse portion, that's the third portion of the duodenum. And the reason this happens is the superior mesenteric artery around it, it's enveloped by lymphatic tissue, adipose tissue. It has a, a mesenteric fat pad that allows for, you know, a cushion basically between the artery and the duodenum. And when you lose that mesenteric uh, fat pad, that compresses on the distal duodenum. Um, some risk factors for this, just um, not particularly high yield, but just to know include cancer, HIV. Um, if, you, if someone has a, like a malabsorption syndrome, like celiac disease, for example, um, and scoliosis surgeries. So, but the big thing you want to remember is that it affects the transverse portion of the duodenum and just kind of what the presentation looks like. Now, the other kind of um, pathology you can run into with this artery has to do with uh, compression of the left renal vein. So we can see here the superior mesenteric, here's the aorta in the background, and the superior mesenteric artery is uh, coming off here. And as it comes off, underneath it is the left renal vein. And so there's a side view of this. So in, in a normal situation, you have that, that cushion, that fat pad between this left renal vein and the superior mesenteric artery. But in some cases, it can push down on that left renal vein and kind of plug it up. And so everything distal to that vein, remember, this blood is coming back to the inferior vena cava. This blood will all back up, and um, it will give you um, this, these dilated, tortuous uh, renal uh, veins. And so, again, uh, for this is called nutcracker syndrome when you squish this left renal vein. And the compression occurs between the aorta, once again, and the uh, superior mesenteric artery. Three. The inferior mesenteric artery branches anastomose with the superior mesenteric artery branches via the marginal artery. <clears throat> okay, so again, let's just review what the inferior mesenteric artery does here. So we said that the right uh, colic and middle colic branches were supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. So we can see that here, and here's the iliocolic artery. Um, all that yellow is the superior mesenteric artery. Now we're looking kind of at this side of the tra uh, transverse colon and descending colon. So now we're looking at the inferior mesenteric artery, which is going to take over about two thirds of the way through the transverse colon. So now we're on this person's left side. And so we call it the left colic artery uh, branching off of the inferior mesenteric artery. There is also, as we go down here, we get to the sigmoid colon. And so naturally the artery is named the sigmoid artery. It supplies the descending colon and sigmoid colon. And eventually we get down to the, um, the rectum. And so we have a superior rectal artery. Now, note that the inferior rectal artery does not come off the inferior mesenteric artery, okay? It's just the superior rectal artery. Okay, well, that's going to be really important in uh, a few slides. But this is just going to supply the upper portion of the rectum. So this whole region from the, the one-third distal transverse colon down to the, rec the superior rectum here is all going to be supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery, and that comes off the abdominal aorta at aorta at L3. Okay, so the superior mesenteric artery was L1, inferior is L3, and then remember the celiac trunk, that's T12. So the significance here, and here's another picture where you can kind of see the superior mesenteric artery, the aorta, and the inferior. Now, the big thing here that I want you to kind of remember is that these arteries all anastomose, right? So the inferior mesenteric branches are anastomosing with the superior mesenteric branches via the middle colic artery and the left 
cold artery. And this kind of uh, area that it does this is um, it's at the splenic flexure. So it's when there's a turn here in the colon, um, kind of where the, the spleen is located, and it's also known as Griffith's point. The artery specifically that does this anastomosis is sometimes called the marginal artery or the artery of Drummond. So about uh, less than half of all people actually have a full network of collaterals and arcades here to actually uh, supply this region completely. And so if there is any ischemia at all or, or a low blood flow state or someone has hypotension or they're dehydrated, whatever it is, this area is affected very early because um, of the lack of collaterals here in most people. There's also another artery that's responsible for this anastomosis that's known as the meandering mesenteric artery, the artery of Riolan. But um, again, this, is, this particular one is not quite as high yield. The big one to remember is the marginal artery of Drummond. Four, ischemic colitis presents uh, commonly presents with hematochesia and left-sided lower abdominal pain. So again, um, ischemic colitis occurs when there's reduced blood flow at watershed area. So what's a watershed area? Watershed area uh, is an area where there isn't as much perfusion as a lot of the other areas. So it's usually the first areas affected. So in the brain, when we talk about you know low volume states or, or low blood flow states, um, we talk about you know what areas would be affected first. Those are the watershed area. So it's the same concept here in the colon. Um, we have watershed areas, particularly high yield. To remember is that the splenic flexure is the area we just talked about, which is, um, we talked about the artery here, the marginal artery, or the marginal artery of Drummond. So again, think volume down states. So someone that uh, just had a, a traumatic injury, that maybe they were in a car accident and they lost a lot of blood, or maybe they have sepsis. Um, those are states where you would have this uh, ischemic colitis presentation, where they'll have hematochesia, left-sided lower abdominal pain. Now there is another watershed area, the next high yield one, uh, I want you to kind of remember is the rectosigmoid junction. Okay, so where the sigmoid colon comes into the rectum, that is also uh, a common area to have reduced blood flow. Um, the other kind of way that this can happen is you can have atherosclerosis of the superior mesenteric artery, which is actually um, a more common pathology than you would think. Now, shock, I think, and trauma and sepsis and all that, that's going to be more common overall, but a particular uh, kind of atherosclerotic area that tends to cause this is atherosclerosis of the superior mesenteric artery. You can also have, if someone has like AFib or something, you can also throw a clot, you know, down into, you know, the superior mesenteric artery or something like that, and that can also cause ischemic colitis. Not as likely, they'd have to give you more kind of pushing you towards either someone with endocarditis or AFib or something like that. Now, the classic sign you see here is the thumb printing sign on imaging. So let's open this up here. So you can see this here in this uh, distal portion of the colon, these, these um, you know, whiter areas here, and those areas are representing the thumb printing sign. It's almost like if you took your thumb and, and punched it in over here. And, it's, and essentially what this is, is bowel wall thickening that's happening in a segmental pattern. So it's, things are getting very thick here because of this redu reduced perfusion and there's some inflammation and whatnot. And then here we have a uh, transverse cut here looking, and you can see in this case, it's these darker regions all down here that are in the, the colon that represent this bowel wall thickening, also known as the thumbprint sign. Now, you can imagine if someone is in a low volume state, typically they're going to have an elevated lactate, particularly if they're septic. So that's another uh, lab you can look for to kind of push you towards this ischemic colitis type picture. Five, parasympathetic innervation to the hindgut is via the pelvic splanchnic nerves. So Let's just review uh, some embryology here really quickly. Uh, so foregut, midgut, hindgut, that's really our, our three areas we're gonna divide the, the GI system up into. So in terms of blood supply, the celiac trunk, right? We already talked about that, that's the foregut. And then we have the midgut, which is the superior mesenteric artery, and the hindgut, which is the inferior mesenteric artery. Okay, so those are the three that we talked about. So I'm gonna jump to the bottom bullets here. What's included in each area of uh, you know the foregut, midgut, hindgut. So in the foregut, the celiac trunk region is our stomach, which should make sense to you, right? Because all those arteries we talked about um, that branch off the celiac trunk, right? So you have your left gastric, your right gastric, which comes from your eventually comes from your common hepatic, right? Your gastroepiploics, all that that comes from the celiac trunk, and so those supply the stomach and also the proximal duodenum, right? We talked about the su uh, superior uh, pancreatic duodenal artery. Now, the liver, right, is also supplied by the celiac trunk. That makes sense, right? Our hepatic arteries come from there. The cystic artery comes from the, you know, the hepatic uh, artery proper. So this should all make sense to you. Um, the pancreas um, is also supplied by some of the foregut and then the spleen, right, the splenic artery. Okay, so midgut, the distal duodenum is included in there. We already talked about that with the inferior pancreatic duodenal uh, artery and then up to the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. So everything in between is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. And then the hindgut um, is the inferior mesenteric artery, which is what we just talked about, the distal one-third of the transverse colon all the way to the upper portion of the rectum. 
Okay, so now let's just talk about the innervation of these areas. So the parasympathetics are actually not too bad. So the vagus nerve is going to do most of the parasympathetic innervation for the foregut and the midgut. In the hindgut, the pelvic splenic uh, nerves from S2 to S4 are going to be responsible for most of the parasympathetics in this area. In terms of the sympathetics, um, the greater splenic nerves are going to be uh, go, uh, eventually synapsing to the celiac ganglion. And in the midgut, it's going to be the lesser splenics going to the superior mesenteric ganglion. So you can see the celiac, celiac, right? Superior, superior, inferior, inferior. So a lot of this is pretty consistent. If you can just remember the, if you can just remember greater splenics, lesser splenics, and then lumbar splenics, um, you can kind of organize your pre and post um, innervations. Okay, six. Signs of portal hypertension include caput medusae and esophageal and anorectal varices. So. Um, where to begin here? So portal hypertension. So remember that recall that there is a portal system of blood that goes to the liver, and in portal hypertension, there's increased pressure within the portal venous system. Okay, um, and essentially what, what we're kind of talking about here. So let's let's see if I can make this picture bigger. So we have our liver here, and we have some blood coming in, right? So this is the portal vein. The liver is mostly going to be supplied by the portal system. Okay, so most of the blood coming into the liver, yes, there's a hepatic artery, that's true, but most of the blood coming into the port, uh, to the liver is from the portal vein. Okay, so it comes in the portal vein, and um, eventually it's going to go through the liver, and then we'll form hepatic veins that leave the liver and go to the inferior vena cava. Now, in portal hypertension, for some reason, there's an increased pressure here, and that pressure is determined by a gradient, which is basically the difference in pressures between the portal system and the pressures that are within the IVC or the hepatic veins. And so if some kind of resistance develops here, or there's some increase in resistance, and the most common thing, if you think about it, would be cirrhosis, right? If you had cirrhosis of the liver, that would cause some resistance in the, in the portal veins, and um, eventually that would lead to a increased pressure in these portal veins, and that can cause portal hypertension. The other things that can do this are portal vein thromboses. So it can be a prehepatic, right? I can get a thrombosis here, or I can get a thrombosis way out here, outside of the of the liver. Another thing that can cause this is constrictive pericarditis, right? If if there's a really high pressure from the pericardium on the heart, that's going to back blood flow out of that right atrium up all the way back into the liver. Okay, um, so all these things can do it. Uh, Bud Chiari syndrome particularly is an occlusion of these hepatic veins here. So that's a, a commonly tested principle, but all of those things can cause portal hypertension. So now we're saying, okay, fine, we cause portal hypertension. What do we see on physical exam? Well, we, to understand that, you have to know what veins make up the portal vein, right? Because you have to figure out what backs up here. So, okay, so what veins make it up? So the left gastric vein, splenic vein, the superior mesenteric vein, and the inferior mesenteric vein. Now note, the inferior mesenteric vein goes into the splenic vein, okay, and eventually uh, they come together here, and that makes uh, this portal vein. So you have the left gastric vein, splenic vein, superior mesenteric vein, and for all intents and pur purposes, also the inferior mesenteric vein, okay? So a lot of the components that we talked about on the arterial side come together to form this. So let's look at some of the anastomoses. These are the big ones you, you want to know. The first one is paraumbilical. So the epigastric veins in, are around the stomach, um, synapse and anastomose, not synapse, the anastomose with the paraumbilical veins. And that gives you this presentation here, this caput medusae. So you see these very dilated, torturous veins. This person also has some ascites as well, consistent with some kind of liver pathology, most likely. Um, <clears throat> so the esophagus is the other area that you want to be aware of. And the Azygous vein, branches the azygous vein, I should say, branch uh, with the left gastric vein, right, here, and that causes esophageal varices, right? So if this pressure is all backed up, it's bringing all of this blood back into that left gastric vein, and it's backing it up, and you're going to get varices. And, and a lot of times you might see this in someone who is abusing alcohol, for example, and they might have a cirrhotic liver causing portal hypertension, causing a backup of blood through the left gastric vein, all the way back into the esophagus, causing esophageal varices. And these can bleed, and these are very dangerous as well. Um, the other uh, kind of area is the rectum. So the middle and inferior rectal veins, anastomose with the superior rectal vein. Now remember what I, what I said earlier, the superior rectal artery, okay, is a branch of the inferior mesenteric artery. So the superior rectal vein will eventually go into the inferior mesenteric vein. So if blood is all backed up here, again, maybe we have a cirrhotic liver, maybe we have Bud Chiari syndrome, whatever it is, it's gonna push the blood back, through the splenic vein, through the inferior mesenteric vein, through the superior rectal vein, and then you're going to get um, this dilation here. And in the rectum, the, the thing that you'll see a lot of times is anorectal varices, but yeah, these commonly present as hemorrhoids. Okay. Um, the middle and the inferior rectal veins, these guys, they drain into the iliacs, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But again, the superior rectal vein drains into the inferior 
mesenteric vein. And the way that people kind of remember these varices is the gut, the butt, and the kappa. Oh, I think I did that wrong. The gut is the esophagus, the butt is the rectum, and the kappa is the kappa medusae. Okay, so that's, the, that's kind of a shortcut way to remember it. But if you understand this anatomy, I think it will make more sense to you. Seven. Meissner's nerve plexus lies in the submucosa. Okay, so just really quickly, let's just go through the organization of the GI tract because this, um, you know, commonly comes up in questions. And these are the kind of nitty-gritty things that you want to have some kind of understanding of. So we'll just go from, so we have the lumen of our, um, you know, our whatever organ, we're going to say the stomach, right? We have the lumen here. And the first layer, so if we're going down from the lumen, the first layer we're going to hit is the, the, as the mucosa. So this is this major area here, the mucosa. Now the mucosa has three layers, okay? So the epithelium, this just lines the surface. These are just the cells, typically cub uh, simple cuboidal or simple columnar, um, and they just have secretor uh, secretory and absorb uh, absorptive functions, okay? Particularly in the small intestine and large intestine. Now most of this mucosal epithelium right on the surface here, it's avascular, okay? So that's why you need a layer underneath it that contains blood and lymphatics so it can support the epithelium. So that's the lamina propria. The layer beneath that is this very, usually very thin double layer of smooth muscle. It can be single layer in areas like the esophagus, and it's labeled here, let me make this a little bigger, it's labeled here as MM, right? This last layer here in the mucosa is this very thin layer of muscle tissue, smooth muscle, that is um, responsible for contraction and movement of the mucosa, of this region up here, okay? Now you have another layer, so now the mucosa is here, so now we're going from the mucosa into the submucosa. Now the big thing you want to remember about the submucosa is this is where we have uh, Meissner's nerve plexus, or conveniently named the submucosal nerve plexus. There's larger blood vessels here, okay, in the submucosa, there's lymphatics, Okay, so the lamina propria is mostly just responsible for supplying the epithelium up here. Down here is where we have kind of the bigger guns in terms of the arterial, venous side, all that stuff. Okay, and then we get to the very last, um, well, not very last, but very last major area, I should say, which is the, uh, here it's the muscularis propria. Um, it's also called muscularis externa. And in this area, it's really just a, a muscle layer. Now, the big thing you want to remember here is that between these layers of muscle is orbox plexus. Okay, or the myenteric uh, nerve plexus. And that is between two layers of this tissue. Okay, and that contraction, so so why is there a nerve plexus here and why is there one here? Okay, so the um, Meissner's nerve plexus is, has more to do with secretions and regulating blood flow and absorption and that kind of thing. This t this nerve plexus down here has is more to do with innervating these um, this muscle tissue so that you can get peristalsis. Okay, so there it's there are two different things, right? The contraction down here from uh, from orbox plexus is more for peristalsis. The Meissner's nerve plexus up here is more about regulating blood flow, absorptive functions, all that stuff. Okay, so that's kind of the major differences. And then you can see here that there's different layers of tissue. You have a longitudinal layer, then here we have a transverse, almost looks like a transverse cut of some of the muscle tissue. So there's different um, directions that these muscle fibers are running in. One thing that I also want to call your attention to is that when we're looking at these, these structures, and here's another picture going from lumen out, when we're looking at these structures, um, remember that if you have a question with somebody that has peptic ulcer disease or something like that, erosions, okay, erosions only go down to the submucosa. So something that kind of, you know, erodes into the tissue down here, that's an erosion down to the submucosa. If, however, the, um, you know, erosion or ulcer, whatever it is, I guess it would be an ulcer if it goes any further. If it goes any further into the tissues, right, into the muscular propria or further, that's an ulcer. So an ulcer can extend through all the tissues and erosion can only go through the submucosa. And it might sound like, oh, that's, you know, just kind of a terminology thing, but these are the things you should know. You have to know all these little details because these are the kind of questions that commonly come up and get asked. Now, the last layer here is either a serosa or an adventitia. Um, and in general terms, if it's intraperitoneal, um, it's a serosa. If it's outside of the peritoneum or extraperitoneal, then we just call it an adventitia, okay? So those are kind of the things to remember here. Um, and I have a couple a couple other images here. So here we can see two layers of smooth muscle, right? This layer is kind of running longitudinally. This layer uh, perhaps is more transverse. And in between them, we have these nerve cells. And so that is your orbox plexus, okay? Or your myenteric plexus. So there's an image of kind of what that looks like. Um, let's see what we have here. Uh, again, a picture of orbox plexus. And the way that you kind of detect this, if there was just an arrow pointing at this and you're like, what is this? I have no idea what this is. You know, you can see the muscle fibers here are running one way, and you can see the muscle fibers here are running another. When you see muscle fibers running two different ways, and you're looking at something between them, it's pretty likely that you might that you might be talking about orbox plexus, okay? Especially in the right clinical context of a question that, that might be asking you about it. And uh, let's see, last picture here. 
So again, we have the lumen up here. This is the mucosa. We see a lot of mucus secreting cells all along here. And then we see some muscle tissue and something in between the muscle tissue here. That is your Meissner's nerve plexus. Now, um, note that these, this muscle tissue is right up against the mucosa. So that's why this is the submucosal nerve plexus, right? It's not completely enveloped um, by uh, distinct layers of muscle tissue. So that's my take on um, those two. Hopefully that gives you some context. And one last thing, if, this, if you're just looking for a short way to remember this last minute, you can remember that the um, submucosal layer or Meissner's nerve plexus is responsible for secretions. So S for submucosal, S for secretions. Eight, the hepatoduodenal ligament contains the portal triad of vessels. So we're going to talk about a lot of these ligaments, and this, this can be very um, overwhelming. It's a lot of material to kind of just condense, but I'm going to try and simplify it for you because this thing always left me scratching my head um, in med school. So let's take this picture, kind of move it out of the way, and let's just look at the structure really quick and talk about a couple things. So the hepatoduodenal ligament, um, I'll talk about in a moment, but I just want to clear a couple things up. First off, the lesser omentum. If you don't know what the lesser omentum is, it's essentially going to be a combination of two ligaments. So this ligament here, so remember, this is the lesser curvature of the stomach, right? And then you have your, your liver up here. And then we also have our duodenum here, okay? So from the liver to the duodenum is the hepatoduodenal ligament, and from the liver to the lesser curvature of the stomach is the hepatogastric ligament. So these two ligaments are pretty close together, and so this area makes up the lesser omentum. Now, um, this, there's an area, so if you can imagine, right, there's this ligament and then behind this ligament there's almost like a little pouch okay so that little pouch um, is an area that we'll talk about in a moment but the area that leads into that pouch is the epiploic foramen okay or the foramen of Winslow okay so we'll talk about that in a moment as well so that's the lesser momentum so those two ligaments and there's like a little pouch behind them there's a little opening that you can kind of stick your finger in behind them and that opening is the foramen of Winslow and this area here that makes this pouch, I guess you could say, is the lesser omentum. Now the greater omentum is actually this whole um, structure. It's like a big, you know, think of like a, a ton of kind of fat and other tissue kind of just going all the way down the rest of the organs, okay? And the greater omentum is made up of three ligaments that kind of hold it together. Um, the gastrosplenic ligament, so from the greater curvature of the stomach here to the spleen, you can see a little bit of it right there, there's your spleen, and uh, the splenorenal. So this part you can't see. So this this whole thing, the greater momentum, I always remember, it comes from dorsal mesentery. And I think dorsal, I'm thinking posterior wall. So um, the spleen has kind of a piece of this momentum that attaches it uh, towards the kidneys and the posterior uh, abdominal wall and kind of hatches it over there. And that's how I always remember that this comes from dorsal mesentery. And we'll talk about that as well. Um, the gastrocolic ligament, it comes off of the greater curvature of the stomach as well and uh, goes to the transverse colon. So you can see that a little bit here. So this is the greater momentum. This is the lesser momentum. Okay. And um, let's see, let's just go through these one by one here really quickly. So um, hepatogastric ligament is this one here, right? It's just like it says from the liver to lesser curvature. If you can picture this in your mind, it makes it a little bit easier. And remember what arteries are here, left and right gastric arteries, right? So we remember, if we remember earlier, the left gastric artery comes off the celiac trunk, right? And it goes to the left kind of lesser curvature of the stomach right here. So that's going to be included in this ligament. And if you remember the right gastric artery, where does that come from? That you should be saying the hepatic artery uh, proper, right? And that's going to go towards this right portion of this person's uh, lesser curvature. Okay, hepatoduodenal ligament. This is the big one. If you're like, oh, this is, I can't wrap my head around this. This is the one thing you want to know. The hepatoduodenal ligament has the hepatic artery proper in it, the common bile duct, and the portal vein. So an easy way to kind of remember that is the two blood supplies going to the liver and then the bile duct, right? The common bile duct. All traveling in the hepatoduodenal ligament. The greater omentum... Right, so now we're talking about more of the greater curvature of the stomach. We're going to have the short gastric arteries, right, and the gastrosplenic ligament, which makes sense. Remember, the splenic artery gives off the short gastric arteries, so that makes sense that it's in the gastrosplenic ligament. Um, the splenorenal ligament contains the splenic artery. Again, makes sense. Well, you say, well, how does that make sense? Well, remember, the splenic artery runs behind the stomach, right? We said that. So if it's running behind the stomach, then that makes sense that it would be in the splenorenal because it's going back. It's going backwards, right? The splenic vein, right, is also there. And then the tail of the pancreas. It's particularly high yield to remember that interesting, uh, or not so interesting fact, that the tail of the pancreas is running in the splenorenal ligament. Um, as far as the gastrocolic ligament, remember, now we're talking about the greater curvature, kind of transverse colon area, right? 
And so what runs over here by the greater curvature? The gastroepiploic, the right gastroepiploic from the gastroduodenal, right, which came from the common hepatic, and then the left uh, gastroepiploic as well, okay? So um, kind of wrap your head around that. If you can remember the anatomy in the early videos, I think that might help you a little bit um, with this one. Nine, the Pringle maneuver can be used to control hepatic bleeding. So remember, the hepatic artery and portal vein are both running through the hepatoduodenal ligament. If someone is in an injury where they, you know, have a liver, some kind of liver trauma or liver laceration, I should say, or penetrating trauma, for example, and there's a concern for hemorrhage or shock, you can control how much blood is going to the liver by pinching that that hepatoduodenal ligament um, and preventing too much blood from getting to the liver or any blood at all, for that matter, to control the bleeding and prevent hemorrhage or shock. Okay, so that's the concept. Now, if you're doing it and the liver is still bleeding, bleeding profusely, and you're like, well, there's no blood going in the liver, so where's this blood coming from? It has to be, right, from the venous side of the liver, blood going kind of retro back into the liver from either the IVC or the hepatic vein. So kind of keep these things in mind. Um, you know, if you see a question that someone's doing a Pringle maneuver and the liver is still bleeding profusely, right, think of these, these concepts of why that would be happening. It's got to be blood coming from the venous side. Um, you also have to be really careful when you're doing these, these kind of, you know, like the Pringle maneuver, for example, if, you, if you're doing this for eight or nine minutes, you can induce hepatic ischemia, uh, what we call shock liver, right? That's hepatic ischemia. You have through the roof, AST and ALT. We're talking the thousands. It looks like a viral hepatitis. Um, so you have to be uh, very careful doing that. 10. The distal edge of the hepatoduodenal ligament creates the opening of the lesser sac or foramen of Winslow. Okay. So again, we talked about this a little bit earlier. So here's our two ligaments that make up the lesser omentum, right? And then if you can imagine, right behind this, right, there's like a little opening. It's like a little cave in here you can go into. And the opening of that cave is the foramen of Winslow, okay? Um, now, the thing that I said earlier is, I'm just going to jump to this because it's on my mind right now. So the thing I said earlier is that the greater omentum eventually attaches back through the splenorenal ligament back towards the posterior wall, right? That's So I remember that concept and remember that the greater momentum and all of its ligaments come from dorsal men mesentery. So everything, right, it, mostly everything except for these two. And there are some exceptions to that. But if you remember what's included in, in, the, uh, in the ligaments and the greater momentum, you can remember those are from dorsal mesentery. Now, these ligaments here, the gastrohepatic and the hepatoduodenal, are going to come from ventral mesentery, okay? And these are the type of nitty-gritty painful things that you have to remember for the test, okay? And so here I put the dorsal mesentery derivatives just again so you can review them, and these are all the portions of the greater momentum. Okay. Um, the felsiform ligament I also want to touch on here for a minute. Now the liver, right, all of these ligaments in their name, they tell you where they go, right? The felsiform ligament doesn't say that directly, but um, it's the it's this ligament is not attaching to another organ, rather the liver is attached to the anterior abdominal wall with the falciform ligament. And the big thing you want to know about that is included in the ligament is the ligamentum teres uh, hepatis. I probably did not pronounce that right, but there you have it. Um, and this is an embryological remnant of the left umbilical vein. So this is a very high yield concept that should be, uh, you know, something that you ingrain in your brain so it can kind of be an easy point on, uh, on the test. But um, this is something you definitely want to know as well. 11. Pectinate or dentate line is the junction between endoderm and ectoderm. Okay, so um, here we have the, we're looking at the rectum, okay? And so uh, this line here, this pectinate line, is going to separate two very different divisions um, between the uh, rectum anal canal area, okay? Um, so again, anal canal uh, is going to have two portions, a visceral portion, which is endoderm. That kind of makes sense, right? Think about visceral organs. Um, you're thinking a lot of times endoderm, right? GI system is uh, endoderm. And then it's going to have a somatic portion, which is going to be derived from ectoderm. Now, the upper two-thirds is the visceral portion. So that's here. That's the endoderm coming from the GI tract, right? So the upper portion is coming from, you know, sigmoid colon, transverse colon, all that. So that's endoderm. The lower one-third portion here is more of the perineal area, and that's going to be somatic, okay? And recall, so that if we talked about this a little bit earlier, so the hindgut um, forms up to about the superior rectum, right? And so this area is all kind of com coming from the hindgut or endoderm. Uh, this lower portion, the somatic portion, comes from the proctoderm, which is ectodermal in origin, okay? And the only other thing here I want to mention is that this pectinate line is uh, the way to kind of identify it is it's located at the junction of the inferior limit of these anal valves. So the inferior limit of these anal valves. 12. 
The visceral portion of the anal canal is a site of adenocarcinoma. So um, if we're talking about the upper two thirds, right, coming from the GI tract, the histology is simple columnar, which we would expect, right, coming from the GI tract. Our arterial supply is the superior rectal artery. Where does the superior rectal artery come from? Hopefully you, this is uh, getting uh, punched in your brain now. It's coming from the inferior mesenteric artery. The venous drainage of this area is through the superior rectal vein, right? We talked about that. That superior rectal vein goes back to the inferior mesenteric, which goes to the splenic, which goes to the portal system. And if we have cirrhosis or blood Chiari syndrome, whatever it is, that blood can get backed up. We can end up with anal rectal varices, right? In this area, in the upper two thirds, okay? The lymphatics are the internal iliac lymph nodes, okay? And the innervation is gonna be visceral innervation, as we would expect coming from the GI system. So the cancers that you will see in this area, in uh, the regions around the pectinate line, in the upper two-thirds, adenocarcinoma. Why? Simple columnar epithelium, right? In the lower one-thirds, squamous cell carcinoma. And I think you can guess what the tissue is going to look like, hint, hint, this image, when you get to the lower one-thirds. 13. External hemorrhoids are painful and below the pectinate line. So hemorrhoids... Um, are essentially going to be uh, these venous uh, blockages here that can, or venous dilations that are going to be in two distinct areas. They're separated by two distinct areas, again, based on where the pectinate line is. We say it's either internal or external. And the reason that we kind of separate them is because one is very painful and one is not painful at all. And if you think about the innervations to these areas, right, we said that the upper two thirds is a visceral innervation, the lower uh, one third is a somatic innervation. The somatically innervated cells, right, kind of like your skin, right, you pinch your skin, it hurts. You know, if you have this venous dilation here, especially, uh, you know, during, you know, when you're going to the bathroom or whatever it is, that's going to hurt a lot when you, when you valsalva or put pressure on that area. Whereas in the visceral area, you really can't feel your, your uh, GI system, so you're not really going to feel it. It's usually not going to be painful. So, we talked about the upper one-third of the pectinate line. Let's talk about what's beneath it, the lower one-third, stratified squamous epithelium. That's why you can get you know, squamous cell carcinoma as opposed to adenocarcinoma in the upper two-thirds. Uh, arterial supply is the inferior rectal arteries. The inferior rectal arteries come from the internal pudendal arteries, and they do not come from the inferior mesenteric. This is commonly confused. So this is different from the superior rectal artery. Okay, Venous drainage just like the arterial side, goes from uh, the inferior rectal vein to the inferior pudendal vein to the internal iliac to the IVC. And the lymphatics are superficial inguinal because now we're getting kind of towards the surface, the um, surface of the tissue here. We're outside now, getting outside of the anal canal. And the innervation, as we talked about, inferior rectal nerve, branch of pudendal once again. So because of that, hemorrhoids in the lower one-thirds of the anal canal are painful, right? Somatic, ectoderm. Internal, upper two-thirds, not painful. Visceral, endoderm. Portal hypertension, which one will it cause? It causes internal hemorrhoids, usually. Why does it cause internal, usually? And you should kind of think about this. And the reason is, it's because, right, the superior rectal vein is draining blood from the upper two-thirds, and that eventually goes into the portal system. 14. Sad pucker is the mnemonic for retroperitoneal structures. I just put this in here for complete list, completeness, excuse me, and um, just a couple quick things with this. So yes, you should write this down like, you know, two or three times a day for like seven days and you'll probably remember it. Um, and these are all the structures that are behind the perineum. And here's an image to kind of help you remember this. Sometimes these questions just come out where they're just flat out asking you for, you know, which one of these is, is or is not a retroperitoneal structure. Um, but things to remember, because it can get, they can, the devil's in the details, right? So duodenum, it's not the proximal duodenum. It's the, it's the distal duodenum, parts two through four, that are retroperitoneal. The pancreas is retroperitoneal, but the tail is not. And remember, there's a ligament, right, that this tail is in that we talked about earlier. Ureters, um, the colon, the ascending and descending colon are retroperitoneal. Um, the transverse colon is not retroperitoneal. Uh, the esophagus is just the lower two-thirds, and the rectum is just the upper two-thirds. 15. Barrett esophagus is at risk of progression to adenocarcinoma. So um, a very classic image you see here is we have some stratified uh, squamous epithelium, and then we go into having these um, starting to form this mucosal tissue that has these gastric pits and, and um, you know, very different looking from this stratified squamous epithelia. Um, so this would represent kind of the transition from esophageal tissue down to some kind of columnar tissue 
here potentially uh, perhaps going into the stomach. But this can also happen, this transformation can happen in the esophagus, right? So just reviewing the esophagus, we start out with striated muscle at the proximal one-third, and eventually the percent striated decreases and the percent smooth muscle increases until we get to the distal one-third where there's um, pretty much mostly all smooth muscle, okay? Um, in Barrett's esophagus, there's some damage, something that's causing damage to the esophagus. Typically, this is, um, you know, stomach acid. So typically, it's because of GERD. And that damage uh, eventually causes the tissue around it to respond because the tissue has erosions and, um, you know, there's something that needs to happen to decrease the acidity of, you know, whatever's flowing up in the esophagus, right? So in, in a way, it's kind of smart that the body does this metaplasia, changes the tissue um, to uh, simple, um, from simple, uh, or excuse me, from strat stratified squamous to columnar. So in some ways, that's really smart that the body's doing that. But eventually what happens is this can lead to um, dysplasia. So this can lead to eventually forming uh, an adenocarcinoma. And um, the thing that you can look for is the intestinal metaplasia and then goblet cells. Goblet cells typically shouldn't be in the esophageal tissue. And again, common cause of that is chronic GERD. If you do an endoscopy, usually you, you can biopsy that area and then look at it histologically to see the, you know, what type of tissue you're dealing with. 16. Parietal cells are eosinophilic, chief cells are basophilic, and mucus secreting cells are pale. So we kind of looked at the esophagus, esophageal tissue, right, that stratified squamous tissue. Now we're looking more at the gastric tissue. So the mucus secreting cells, so here, so let's just go through this really quick to clear this up, because this stuff always, you know, was very difficult for me on step one. So here's the lumen of the stomach. Um, so we have these gastric pits, okay, that start to form. They're filled, surrounded by mucus secreting cells. So why is that? Well, that's because it's so acidic down here that we have to have um, some balance to that acidity uh, in the gastric pits. So enzymes will work at certain pHs and all that kind of stuff. So that's what the mucus cells are doing mostly here in the gastric pits. Then when you go further, you're in the isthmus and the neck and eventually the base of the gastric tissue, okay? Now the parietal cells, right, parietal cells release hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Those are mostly in the isthmus and neck region. So they're a little bit further down and you can see a bunch of them. My, my cursor's on one there and one there and one there. Let's make this bigger. So here, these more eosinophilic cells are the parietal cells. Um, very distinct kind of appearance. Let's look at them here as well. So these are all, this is a parietal cell, there's a parietal cell, there's a parietal cell, there's a parietal cell. Okay, so those are the parietal cells. Now the chief cells uh, are the ones that are releasing pepsinogen, and those are mostly going to be way down kind of on the bottom, but there's still some up here as well. Um, so the chief cells are mostly at the base. So here's the chief cells. Uh, very different appearance than the parietal cells. 17. Peptic ulcer disease presents with hypertrophy of Brunner's glands. So um, now we're moving from the stomach to the duodenum, and in the duodenum there's a few things that uh, we look for. Now the biggest one is in the submucosa. Okay, so here's your mucosa up here. Okay, here's some villi, which are responsible for increasing um, surface area, which of which digestion occurs or absorption occurs, and um, they are responsible for this kind of striated border of the enterocytes. And then we have uh, looks like our muscular mucosa, and then in the submucosa down here we have these unique circular structures, right? They're kind of white appearing, lighter colored. Those are the Brunner's glands. So it's good to kind of be able to recognize those. Usually that will signify that you're probably in the duodenum now. What do Brunner's glands do? They release alkaline secretions. They neutralize acidic chyme from the stomach. So if you have peptic ulcer disease, or for some reason you have, you know, acid going into the duodenum, you might have hypertrophy of those glands. Crips of Lieberkin are pretty much throughout the small intestine. They're located in the mucosa, and they release intestinal secretions. And then we also have goblet cells here in villi as well, as I talked about previously. And goblet cells are uh, mucus secreting cells. 18. The jejunum has the highest frequency of villi in the small intestine. So the jejunum um, has a very unique appearance. So it has these almost like tree-like structures. These are the plicae uh, circularis. And you can see plicae circularis in the other areas of the small intestine, but they're by far the most prominent in this particular area in the jejunum. Um, also, you can see the crypts of Lieberkin as well in here, goblet cells. Um, let's see if we can see any here. You can see some of these white dots all over here. Those are goblet cells or mucus secreting cells. There's more goblet cells and more villi in the jejunum than, are, than is in the duodenum, okay? And again, these plicae circularis are circularly arranged, uh, kind of transverse folds, and they contain in them, in the middle here, if you think about like a tree, right? It's got its roots down here in the middle here, coming up from, from the roots, uh, perhaps, is the submucosa. So it extends the submucosa into these uh, plicae, okay? And again, these are more prominent than anywhere else in the small intestine. 
and there is the highest frequency of villi here as well. 19. Ileal mucosa contains Peyer's patches. So Peyer's patches are aggregates of un uh, move this picture here for a second of unencapsulated lymphoid tissue. So here's our ileum, right? Here's the lumen. Here we have our um, villi and mucosa, and then down here we have this these big dark purple dots. So that's lymphoid tissue, um, aggregates of it, and it's in the lamina propria and the submucosa. Okay. Now the actual process by which this works, I'm going to talk about briefly in a second. I'm going to come back to it though. Um, I want to just cover these couple things since we're on the topic of comparing all of these areas of small intestine. So goblet cells, most prominent in the duodenum, that's where we had our Brunner's glands, um, a little bit less common in the jejunum, least common in the ileum, okay? Plica circularis, again, can be seen here, but most prominent in the jejunum. Villi, same thing, and Crypsa lubricant are also here as well. With all that being said, let's just quickly talk about how this lymphoid tissue operates, okay? So let's move this picture out of the way. Let's bring in this picture. Okay, so how does this lymphoid tissue work? So here's our lumen. Here's our, you know, bacteria, whatever it is. The cells kind of lining this lymphoid tissue um, are M cells, okay? So we have some M cells here. Now these M cells, um, and, I, and this doesn't necessarily have to be the lumen, but we can just assume this is a lumen for now. I don't want you to get confused because I know it said it's in the submucosa, but um, let's just say we have some bacteria, uh, you know, floating around here and inside of all the cells that we have here um, next to the enterocytes and everything else, right? These yellow cells might be some enterocytes. And then we have this red cell here that is a M cell. Okay. So anyway, so the M cell is going to bind to, you know, an antigen out here, whether it be a bacteria or a virus, whatever. And so that's going to send a signal down into the dendritic cells. The M cell is going to, going to activate kind of one of these dendritic cells inside of the lymphoid tissue. The dendritic cell is going to eat this thing up, engulf it, and um, basically uh, process the antigen and deliver it to lymphocytes, okay? And when it does this, it releases interleukin-6, right? An acute phase reactant. So what happens? So once it does that, it will kind of trigger a response for a follicular helper T cell to come over into the follicle. So the dendritic cell will engulf the bacteria, kind of activate a cascade that gets a helper T cell here. The helper T cell will then kind of get activated and interact with an immature B cell. So here you see this IgM B, right? So this is an immature B cell kind of hanging out over here. And the follicular T cell will come in, it'll activate this, this IgM B cell and will bind to it with MHC, right? Onto the T cell receptor. And the other big one you should know is the CD40, CD40 ligand. And recall this binding, when you have a T cell or dendritic cell, you know, whichever one of these guys it is that binds here to this immature uh, IgM B in the Peyer's patch, whoever does that is going to stimulate that immature B cell to turn into a mature B cell, and it will uh, promote differentiation. Now, remember in the gut that most of the time it's going to be IgA that's going to be your primary antibody. So this IgM B cell, after binding to you know either the dendritic cell or the follicular helper T cell or whoever came here after they said, hey, there's a bacteria around that we want to build antibodies to. So once it did that, it'll form uh, an IgA B cell, which you see here, IgA. And then this will leave the tissue and it will secrete the IgA antibodies. The thing that stimulates this, among many things, kind of the bigger one, that stimulates this IgA production is TGF beta. Okay, so TGF beta um, is released from the dendritic cells as well as some other components. And there's a lot more players here. You can see this is really a complicated diagram, right? There's this BAF April signaling and all these other things that, um, you know, can be very uh, overwhelming. But the big things to remember, if you had to recap this, the M cells line the Peyer's patches. They send a signal to the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell can activate the helper T cells and that kind of thing with uh, interleukin-6. And then it will also release some TGF beta that will stimulate the conversion of these immature B cells in the lymphoid tissue to eventually form IgA secreting plasma cells. 20. The liver receives the majority of its blood supply from the hepatic portal vein. So again, two major blood supplies going into the liver via what ligament? the hepatoduodenal ligament, right? The portal vein and the hepatic artery via the uh, hepatoduodenal ligament go into the liver. They eventually, so here, let's look at this picture. Let me move this one out of the way. Okay, so portal vein is here. Here's our hepatic artery. Here is the common, or our, our bile duct, we'll just say in this case. And um, let's focus on the blood. So the, the hepatic artery brings blood in and significantly more blood, that's why this is a lot bigger, is gonna come in via the portal vein. And they're gonna go into these structures here that are called sinusoids. Okay, so that's where the blood's going to kind of flow through, or sinusoids. So sinusoids um, are kind of a unique name for a couple of reasons we'll talk about in a second. But along these sinusoids, there's fenestrations. Okay, so there's openings, there's pores. Kind of like when you think about the kidney, there's pores that stuff can travel through really quickly, okay? 
Um, and we'll, we'll talk about why that's important as well in a second. Okay, so you have these sinusoids, and then along with that, when we're talking about these cells, right, so you can see we have sinusoids, we have a bile duct, so there's a lot of things going on. The apical surface, right, the top of the cells, are going to face the bile canaliculi. So they're going to face the bile, okay? That means that the bottom of the cell, or the basolateral surfaces, are going to face the sinusoids. Okay, so the basolateral surfaces face the sinusoids, apical surface faces the bile canaliculi. Again, these are the devils in the details, right? These are the details you can get asked about. Now, the big thing here to remember is that there is no basement membrane. So again, the bottom of the cell faces the sinusoids, and there's no basement membrane. So number one, we have fenestrated endothelium here. So that's the first thing, and then there's no basement membrane. So it's really easy to get uh, substances to transfer through here. And the space between them is the space of dis. That's what it's called. So let's review all of this in this image. So we have um, our cells here, our hepatocytes here, and then we have um, an endo. We have our sinusoids, where blood's traveling through here, and then we have a space between the cell and the sinusoid, and it has. If you can see all of these little pores in it, along these endothelial cells, so stuff can kind of go in and out, and stuff comes come into the space of dis, and then go into the cell, or come out uh, of the cell into the space of dis, and then out into the sinusoid. And then inside of the space of disc, we also have these Kupfer cells, or dendritic cells, and we have these stellate cells of Ido. Okay, so let me show you what all those things do. So Kupfer cells are phagocytes. Well, like I said, they're dendritic cells. The hepatic stellate cells are essentially derived from kind of like fibroblasts. And if you watched our biochem videos, you, you know those are really responsible for collagen production and, and um, that kind of thing. Now, the interesting thing about the stellate cells is they store vitamin A when quiescent, but if they're activated, they start producing extracellular matrix and collagen and that kind of thing. And if you have an overactivation of them, you can end up with hepatic fibrosis. Okay. And the space of dis, which we talked about, is the perisinusoidal space. And we said that's the site of exchange between hepatocytes and blood. That area is lined by reticulin. So sometimes if you do a liver biopsy and you stain it, you can stain it with reticulin. And recall reticulin is type 3 collagen. Now, I also have one last image I want to show you uh, regarding this. So this is everything we talked about in real life on a histological image. So again, portal triad, right? The big thing, the big thing is the portal vein, right? So portal venule. If they show you a picture of this, you see the three structures. The big thing is the portal vein. Now you have two other smaller structures that can, that can get confused. If you see red blood cells in it, it's an hepatic artery, right? Because there's not going to be red blood cells in the bile duct. And typically these cells are going to be um, thinner cut usually. But if you see blood in it, it's a hepatic artery. And then the other one must be the bile duct. 21. Zone 2 displays eosinophilic apoptotic hepatocytes, known as councilman bodies in yellow fever. So um, the last thing I kind of want to talk about here is the structure and setup of the liver. So, um, you know, we talked about blood flowing in and out of the liver. Um, so blood flow uh, coming in, we have our portal triad, right? So we have our portal vein, our hepatic artery, and then you have your common bile duct and your bile duct. Um, so this is, this is all kind of branches of those structures here in the liver. And then this is the central vein is the blood that's going out of the liver, eventually forming the hepatic vein and going to the IVC. So <clears throat> where's the oxygen coming in? It's coming in from portal vein, right? It's coming in from the hepatic artery, right? So therefore, zone one, if you can remember this setup, right? Portal triads all around and your, your central vein is in the middle that goes to the IVC. So if you remember that, you should remember that the oxygen is coming in from these guys, right? So zone one is going to be around these portal triads. Then zone 2 is going to be here, and zone 3 is going to be on the central vein. Zone 1 is periportal, around the portal system. Highest oxygen. There's the most oxygen coming from those structures. So um, this area would be the least affected by some kind of ischemic process, like hypotension or trauma, hemorrhage, any of that stuff. Right? be the least affected because it gets the most oxygen. What would affect this area? Well, an ingested toxin. Okay, I know the one in first aid they mentioned is cocaine, right? So that's an example. Something that you take in that doesn't need to be metabolized to be harmful. So cocaine is a classic example of affecting this area. And I'll talk about why I capped the ingested here in a second. Zone 2 is this zone. I'm going to come back to it. And let's just go to zone 3 since we're on this topic. So centra lobular, right? Centra, central lobular. So this area. So not the portal area, the central area, central lobular least oxygen, right? The oxygen is coming from the portal system and the hepatic artery. It's not coming from a central vein. So there's not a lot of oxygen here. Therefore, it's the most susceptible to ischemia or shock liver, which we talked about earlier, where you have that huge rise in AST, ALT, all that stuff. Um, so the cytochrome P450 system is also located here at, uh, around the central vein. And so that's where things get metabolized. So for example, alcohol, right? Alcohol gets metab metabolized there, um, you know, alcohol dehydrogenase, et cetera, et cetera. And you get these byproducts that can build up and cause damage. 
um, halothane, CCL4, rifampin. It's not these actual compounds that are doing most of the damage. It's when they're metabolized, they're byproducts that tend to do a lot of the damage. And so that's why uh, metabolic toxins tend to have more an effect in this zone three where the cytochrome P450 system is. So the zone three has two major things that can cause um, pathology here, and that's metabolic toxins as well as uh, any ischemic process. Okay, let's talk about zone two, intermediate, right? Right in the middle. Uh, the big thing to remember for this one is yellow fever. Now, I also read in a couple places dengue fever can cause this and, and rift valley fever. Those aren't as high yield, um, uh, but a lot of the evidence on those two also are not as consistent. The one that everybody remembers is yellow fever. So recall yellow fever is from the 80s mosquito. Um, typically, uh, yellow fever uh, has an incidence in South America and Africa. It's a positive strand linear RNA virus or a flavivirus. Um, with an icosahedral capsule. Okay, so these are all the little details you kind of want to know about it um, in case they ask, what does it do? The big thing, if because if, a lot of diseases, it's like, okay, there's so much to remember. Just Is there one easy way to kind of figure out what it does? Yellow fever, if you can remember that it affects the liver, particularly zone two, it causes a coagulopathy. And you might say, well, how is that? That's because the liver synthesizes the clotting factors, right? So if you can't synthesize clotting factors, you just bleed from everywhere, right? So you get a hemorrhage, you know, in your liver and you're bleeding blood, right? You might have some hematochesia or melanin. Uh, you might have black vomitus, right? I put in here, white positive stool, right? So you're just kind of bleeding from everywhere. The classic finding um, in this disease are these councilman bodies. That you'll see here and if they say it's councilman bodies in zone two that should really uh, point you in that direction so there's these eosinophilic apoptotic bodies you can see some irregular nuclei um, as well and that is something that's um, consistent with yellow fever so thank you for watching i know this video had uh, initially when i was making this video i was thinking like seven or eight topics and it ended up turning into something much more um, but i hope you enjoyed it i hope it uh, wasn't too much for you and if you have any suggestions about a video that you would really like to see on a specific topic um, or a section of topics uh, please feel free to mention a comment below thanks again for watching